In the past few years, AI-generated content has started flooding the internet. The release of ChatGPT in 2022 and its subsequent popularity was a symbolic opening of the gates of misinformation. But this online dynamic isn't particularly new. In fact, it's basically as old as the internet is. The case of larger-scale climate misinformation and denial, for example, started out in the 20th century with opposition against the Kyoto Protocol. The rise of Google and social media, followed by ClimateGate in 2009, led to a true boom of online climate denial groups and a complete right-wing shift of the internet. It seems pretty clear that the existence of the internet cannot be detached from the way people see and talk about climate change, due to both being the defining forces from the past decades. So how exactly does the internet mediate people's relationship with climate change? Opinions are shaped through the information we receive. While spread of information does not directly equal spread of opinions, and people tend to prefer to express their opinions online rather than change them, it's a combination of individual views, attitudes, beliefs, and first impressions that shapes opinions. On the web, due to the prevalence and rapid firing of opinions, even if only a handful of people across the globe are convinced whenever misinformation is pushed to the spotlight by algorithms, this quickly cascades into chaos. We've all heard about crazy online conspiracy theories in the past, and most of them only take hold specifically because algorithms provide users with like-minded people and posts. Content being pushed at random based on what is popular is a problem, as being able to encounter any kind of online opinion, info, or AI-generated content is harmful. However, content being pushed algorithmically towards specific groups is also a problem by creating eco-chambers and bubbles. This can be especially problematic, as people do not always have enough media training and fact-checking skills to realize whenever content they come across is biased or wrong. Additionally, it's not difficult for children and younger teens to overcome what little restrictions the internet has, which can lead to early exposure to incredibly harmful environments and first impressions. This is especially evident with online processes like the alt-right pipeline, where social media acts as a gateway for young men to get radicalized and fall into extremism. Corporate presence and ownership of the major online platforms is also a notable component of the opinion fluxes. As social media are inherently private services, the choice on what to promote or censor is entirely up to for-profit companies. This is one of the main factors driving online discourse as companies will choose to promote divisive subjects in order to get more activity. Oldenburg's thesis goes in depth into the manipulation social media users are subjected to when using corporate-owned services, notably by making the cost of leaving the platforms far too heavy. This has been emphasized by recent events such as Elon Musk's takeover of Twitter, which led to a much unhealthier platform while providing the users no valid alternatives. Nowadays, online interactions have supplanted a lot of real-life interactions. As the new main vector of fast, large-scale human interactions, the online sphere has a considerable impact on our daily lives. It is possibly both the most influential actor and environment politically, economically, and sociologically. Online communication shapes other forms of media and information sources, discourse plays a major part in who gets elected, and policies are influenced directly or indirectly by it. A controlled and unhealthy internet is incredibly threatening to the people's living conditions. So obviously, all of this has a huge impact on climate action. Broadly speaking, the right-wing shift of the internet and increasing radicalization of its user base in recent years has had an effect on individual perceptions of climate change. There are roughly three main ways pushback against climate discussion and action manifests itself. Denialism, doomerism, and delayism. Denialism is the most obvious and old-school form of anti-climate feeling. It's the firm belief that climate change is not happening. It can take multiple forms, straight-up denial of all things climate, underestimating the problem, or twisting reality with conspiracy theories. While in the collective narrative, denialism is associated with the public's ignorance of science, its origin can actually be quite varied. Scientists, governments, political and religious organizations, influencers, but all willing actors usually tie back to the fossil fuel industry. The propagation of short-form content has also encouraged denialism by forcing content to be digestible above all else, without much consideration for how real the information is, and no matter how complex the subject originally was. However, even if the end result is the same, there's still an obvious distinction to be made between ignorance to facts and motivated denial to mislead people to an end. While denialism is born from fear or discomfort as a rejection of change, the dynamics displayed on the internet seem to play a major part in denialism. Climate deniers are overwhelmingly white male conservatives seeking to uphold a system that has benefited them forever, 
with influencers and third parties investing millions to promote questionable content to impressionable young men. A lot of sources tend to believe the nihilism is dying in favor of more insidious methods, such as delayism. And while it seems to have indeed died down a little in certain mainstream traditional media, I would argue it's in fact still thriving on social media. It's just shifted targets, now kind of aiming to convert online youth on social media who will now grow up with misinformed beliefs about climate. Another, more recent facet of anti-climate sentiment is delayism. Unlike denialism, delayism accepts climate change as fact, but aims to slow down action as much as possible through multiple means. It is essentially about maintaining the status quo and is currently the most commonly used strategy for actors to evade their responsibilities, as they're able to evade the negative rep that comes from denialism, while also evading commitments to any sort of positive climate action. Delayism takes many forms, as shown by Metzen et al. Four major themes stand out. Redirecting responsibility, pushing non-transformative solutions, emphasizing the downsides, and doomerism. Although I would personally argue that doomerism isn't necessarily part of delayism. Redirecting responsibility is one of the most common arguments of delayism online. The feeling that we as people, or countries, or groups shouldn't participate in climate action because we aren't 100% responsible for climate change, or because it might hurt us in the long term. I find this argument quite complex because it's difficult to differentiate between strategic deflection and genuine concern towards the environment. After all, it's more than fair to believe that others should reduce their carbon emissions more if they produce more. It is a justified rational belief that isn't necessarily malicious. However, the necessary level of nuance to discuss responsibility is usually absent from social media, leading to that debate being weaponized by actors using it as a shield to not take action. Essentially, online working class frustration about decisions from the 1% turn into more fuel for delayism rather than social and climate justice. The push for non-transformative solutions is another problem the online sphere faces when it comes to climate inaction. I think performative activism is a huge part of it, but the main problem is really like the false equivalency between different kinds of political actions. People liking, reposting, or speaking out about certain issues usually makes waves, while actual action is not talked about as much. Someone avoiding Nestle products is shown as doing their part just as much as someone fighting like pipeline construction, even though the systemic impacts are incomparable. While sharing and speaking out about issues is important, I feel like there is a hidden hierarchy of activism that is completely lost online. In my opinion, this is mostly due to the fact that average day-to-day -day activism gets higher visibility as people are able to relate more. Seeing daily posts from your favorite influencers simply speaking out about geopolitical problems or boycotting a brand feels infinitely more comfortable and relatable and allows for more engagement and visibility than like one post after months of radio silence from actual work and activism on the field. Emphasizing the downsides is also pretty big on the internet. Um, every proposition gets rejected and is subject to endless nitpicking due to the millions of differing opinions online, whether they are in good faith or not. Eventually, the discourse becomes more about listing problems with propositions rather than weighing the trade-offs against fossil fuel use. Outspoken climate activists get tone policed constantly, with pretty blatant examples such as Greta Thunberg being ragged on for being loud or annoying or hysterical. On the other hand, activist purity is also a source of discourse, even within well-meaning groups. Activists are under constant scrutiny for any sign of hypocrisy, any mistake, or any emotion. Essentially, emphasizing the downsides on the internet means like focusing on your discomfort with the messenger, because after all, this is what creates engagement and gets pushed by the algorithm. Doomerism is a mindset of extreme pessimism about the state of the world, and in this case, about climate change. It's about believing that all is lost and any action or resistance against what is coming is futile. The reason why I chose to draw the line between doomerism and delayism is that doomerism is not expecting any kind of action in the future. It's the pure and simple act of giving up, unlike what usually makes up the mask of delayism. Doomerism is a complex and pretty recent trend most likely tied to the decreasing happiness and mental health of young people, and the constant barrage of bad news pushed by algorithms online. It got to a point where doomerism has become a true aesthetic, an identity that entire communities relate to. The doomer is romanticized, and doomerism becomes a cool way to process alienation from current events and loss of control over your life. Unfortunately, this mindset can become incredibly unhealthy very quickly for both doomers and for society as a whole. It becomes a self-realizing prophecy, as believing no action will ever work leads to inaction, 
which in turn leads to everything getting worse and worse, individually and globally. Doomerism also relies pretty heavily on privilege. To be a Doomer, you must really have the luxury of being able to give up in the first place. All these different opinions and psychological mechanisms manifest in different ways online, and there's often confusion between them. In fact, I've listed them off separately as if they could be classified between different people and actors, but truthfully, they're all kind of inseparable. All of us have like related to at least some of these at some point in our lives. While denialism, delayism, and doomerism are all negative factors to climate action, I believe it's impossible to deny that they all stem from basic human feelings and reaction to bad news. In fact, it's not even unrealistic to believe someone might be cycling through all three in a single day, or even hold these positions simultaneously. At their core, all they are is different strategies to cope with the coming crisis. Obviously, some reactions are more valid and helpful than others. Denialism in particular is a like, purely selfish, cover your eyes and pretend it doesn't exist type of coping mechanism. But it doesn't take away from the fact that all we really have here is a human crisis that is being vehicled by the internet. The main problem, at least to me, is that these valid feelings are both created, propagated, and exploited by fossil fuel corporations for their own gain. The weaponization of doomerism, delayism, and denialism by companies is so easy specifically because these feelings are a byproduct of our natural fear of the unknown. In turn, as everything and everyone surrounding us share these feelings and get tired of seeing others go through the same thing with no way out, inaction becomes normalized. I also believe this to be partly caused by the lack of communication and understanding between people online. The anonymity and ambient incivility of social media filters out perspectives unlike your own, leading to everyone silently processing that fear of the future alone or within their own echo chambers. I don't mean to imply that all opinions are equally valid because a lot of online perspectives are incredibly weird or harmful to straight up stupid. But that doesn't take away from the fact that we're all living in our own bubbles, making us more isolated than ever. Algorithms and political polarization have only made this rupture worse, as outrage is prioritized over actual discussion. As of right now, the internet has been a perfect roadblock to the People's Organization for Climate Action. While it has led to a vast spread of knowledge about climate issues, it's also the root of deep anti-climate societal shifts. I want to conclude by saying that I don't believe the current state of the online sphere as of 2025 can be a positive for climate action, and especially not as fossil fuel-fueled corporations are getting more and more power over that space. The first step of many to a purely pro-climate online environment, if it can ever exist, is the fight for a truly free web, starting with the abolishment of the current monopoly of corporations over the internet.